Um, good evening, and um, my name is Amy Bach, and I am the executive director and the co-founder of the nonprofit called United Policyholders that's bringing you this workshop tonight. And we are bringing this to you through what is called the Roadmap to Recovery Program. So um, what is United Policyholders? Definitely not an insurance company. Uh, we are what, uh, what's called a 501c3, which means we are a recognized not-for-profit charity, tax exempt, um, and we have been around for 25 years. Um, and our Roadmap to Recovery program is one of the three things we do. Um, and this is the program through which we educate and support you in navigating a fair insurance settlement after a disaster. Uh, we are funded by donations and grants. We uh, do not take any funding from insurance companies. We, uh, all our online information is free of charge. And most of our work gets done by an incredible core of volunteers who've recovered from prior disasters, um, like Karen Remus, who is our lead instructor tonight. I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about her in a minute. Uh, but also um, consumer-oriented professionals. So not only do we have the, the folks, how many of you have been to the LAC and visit our table, the show of hands? That's fantastic. So um, you know that we bring a very unique kind of support uh, to people who find themselves in your situation. Um, and that is the been there, done that, um, and, and here with a really deep, genuine empathy um, and, a, and a lot of really uh, a good strategies. So um, you, but those folks are paired with our expert volunteers. So um, we have another volunteer right here, John Eisenberg in the front row, who has been at the table and is one of these uh, combo experts that we have who lost his home in a wildfire but is also an attorney and also lives in this area. So um, our organization is blessed with an incredible group of very um, intelligent and warm-hearted, grounded people. So I'm really proud to be here tonight partnering with Jewish Family Children's Services. You're gonna be hearing from them in a minute. So you can learn more about our work at uphelp.org. These are some of the past wildfires we have uh, brought this program to. And you can see that um, in recent years, there's been quite a lot of activity around the state. And one of the families that's at our table today um, went through the Butte fire just a couple years ago. But St. John's fire was, uh, was what, 25 years ago? 26 years, and then Karen's 14 tomorrow. 14 tomorrow. Okay, so a lot of expertise in our family, a lot of um, love. Sorry that we ran out of the little yellow book. Um, we've given away over 700 at the, at the center. We've got another supply coming. We have two more workshops scheduled. We will be doing more after that, but for now, we've got this one tonight. We've got another one on November 1st where we'll be covering structure, getting your uh, arms around your uh, the value of your structure loss, and then your, of course, your insurance claim for that piece, your dwelling. Um, and then we will have another one on the 15th uh, of November where we'll be talking about contents. And at that, by then, I know we will have another supply of the books. They're coming, um, we're getting them as fast as we can, so thank you for your patience. All right, I'm gonna briefly um, review the, uh, some of the tools, and I'm gonna uh, turn the mic over. So we've got um, an uh, Ask an Expert online forum, and so um, if you're, you know, first, we always want you to go to our website first. Um, the, the yellow book when you get that, but then our website, we have a special section just for the North Bay wildfires, and then we have a, a claim help library that has extensive, more information than you'd ever uh, think you could find from a charity um, about every technical aspect of your situation, you know, how, how to figure out how much insurance you have, how to communicate effectively with your insurance company, samples of letters that you can customize and use to write, um, and all kinds of guidance, most of which you're gonna hear uh, tonight from Karen. Um, but if you don't get what you need through the book and through the website and through our workshops, you can also use our Ask an Expert forum and you have to register, it's free. All right, well thank you again for making the time um, and energy to be out here tonight. I know um, it, this is a tough time and there's a lot of meetings and um, hang in there, so thank you. So I am Barbara.
Barbara Tobin with Jewish Family and Children's Services. And what I want to say is we have been part of the entire community for 30 years here in the Sonoma County area, serving the entire community, not just the Jewish community. And we've been serving the Bay Area, our home base of San Francisco. We have been serving since 1850. We're in our 167th year. We are the oldest nonprofit west of Mississippi. So I'm saying that to you because I want you to know we are here for you for the long haul. Because we know that this is going to take a long time. So our information is out on the table. What we are about is helping through connecting you with services, whether it's ours or the range in the community. So please let us know how, what you need, how we can help. And we're very honored to be partnering with United Policy Holders. Hi, good evening everybody. My name is Karen Remus and I'm a 2003 Cedar Fire from San Diego, California. This is my husband and I just shy of 14 years ago. So something tells me that probably all or most of you probably have a picture similar to this at this point. And um, just the first thing I want to say to you is how terribly sorry I am for your loss. It's a devastating loss. I've been there firsthand and um, I just wanted to extend my sympathies on my, behalf of myself, my Cedar Fire community in San Diego. We're just very sorry for your loss. Before I jump into the insurance recovery, 101. I did want to acknowledge a couple people who are here. Um, I saw Tony Signorelli from the California Department of Insurance. Stand up, Tony. So, repping from the California Department of Insurance on the back. So, thank you, Tony, for being here. Um, so, you know who he is. Also, out front, you guys saw these wonderful tote boxes with file folders to help you stay organized. That is from the Scripps Ranch Civic Association and the Out of the Ashes Project which is a project from the Cedar Fire survivors and community. And I really want to acknowledge the people who put those together and drove those up here in a moving van from San Diego. Bob Ilko, are you around? So Bob Ilko, Wes Danskin, Barbara, Linda, da, 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 da. the Out of the Ashes people up on your feet. They're looking very, very shy. But there's a whole group from San Diego, um, again from the Scripps Ranch Civic Association, other Cedar Fire survivors who put those together for you to help you stay organized. So I just wanted to gratefully acknowledge them for that work and making those for you. So if you didn't get one on the, ins on the way in, please grab one on the way out. They are great for keeping you organized. There's different files. You can get all your, you know, the different portions of your paperwork in one handy place and just stash it all right there in those files in that box. All right. So starting right off, our starting point for tonight on this Insurance 101 presentation, knowledge equals power and money. Experience has demonstrated that knowledgeable claimants actually recover more benefits. So again, learning about how your policy works, the recovery process is a really important first step in this journey that you are taking. So again, knowledgeable claimants recover more. And again, coming here is a great first step. Um, your insurance claim is a business transaction, and I would really urge you to try to wrap your head around that. I personally found that really difficult at the beginning because it didn't feel like a business transaction at all. It felt exceedingly personal. That was my home. That was all of my belongings. We did not get anything out of our home um, at all. So it didn't feel like a business transaction. It's not like when you plan to buy a car and you get ready to negotiate and you do all this research, or even if you're gonna build a house and you're like, oh, I'm gonna interview some builders and I'm gonna do some research. None of you plan for this. And so trying to wrap your head around the fact that this is a business transaction, um, again, is gonna help you in terms of, there we go, is gonna help you in terms of understanding the dynamic. As in any business transaction involving money, one party wants to recover more money, one party typically doesn't want to pay any more money than they have to. That's the natural dynamic in any business transaction. So understanding that from the outside, outset will really help you understand how to approach these claims. Many disaster survivors refer to the weeks immediately after their loss event as the honeymoon period with the insurance company. So things may be going very smoothly. There might be some big checks being written. Um, what I would just say is I want you to remember is that the adjuster may be friendly, but the adjuster is not your friend. I'm not saying that it's not a hardworking professional who is doing their very best at their job, but understanding that dynamic and the relationship there is very important. So. 
Should you expect a fight with your insurance company? No, absolutely not. Some claims go smoothly from beginning to end, and I hope all of yours do. That would be great. But when large dollars are at stake, it is not uncommon for disputes to arise, as you might imagine. So getting informed about commonly, you know, commonly encountered problems is a really um, important step that you can take to help you avoid hitting those problems and falling into those pitfalls. Another important tip, try not to rush any aspect of the insurance recovery process. I found this one very hard to take because of course I wanted to rush because I wanted to get back into my rebuilt home. So again, experience has demonstrated that again, it can take weeks slash months for really normal critical functioning to come back online. People have been traumatized, you're exhausted. Um, is anybody sleeping a full night of sleep? Because I sure wasn't after my home burned down. So again, just do your best to try not to rush yourself and give yourself the opportunity to process this information to ensure your recovery. So you really want to give yourself time to do the homework necessary about both the insurance recovery and the rebuild. I know when I went through this process, I kind of looked at it as kind of two separate processes, although of course they were interrelated, obviously. You've got the insurance recovery process, it's got its own you know, issues, dynamics, and then the rebuild. The insurance, by and large, will drive the rebuild, so they are interconnected, but they are two processes that you're dealing with. Insurance, be wary of an adjuster who's trying to rush you to a quick settlement. Again, the amount of money that they're offering may seem like a lot of money, but it may be below what you're entitled to receive. It generally takes a, you know, a fair amount of time to calculate a total on a large loss. So just give yourself the time to do the math, to get the documentation necessary, to understand what you're entitled to receive, et cetera. On the rebuild, often people who rush through that process tend to make mistakes that they regret later. So again, moving through as best as you can, but just trying not to rush yourself in that, just like, ah, oh, I'm gonna get back in six months or nine months. Um, and again, sometimes that does happen, but just try to ease that pressure off yourself so that you can actually document the claim. So review, you wanna review payments that you receive very carefully. You don't wanna accept checks with words like final or full and final settlement unless you're absolutely, absolutely sure that that check or draft is for the full amount owed. So again, if you're sure about that, okay, but if you're not, then rethink that. If necessary, ask the adjuster to reissue that check without those words. So if they're giving you a big check and there's any sort of terminology, full and final, final payments, such, and you're not sure that it is, you're like, mm, I'm not sure, just ask them to reissue that check without those words if you're concerned. So again, be careful before signing. If you're, again, your adjuster asks you to sign a proof of claim form before you know how much um, you have really lost, don't be afraid to write in undetermined under the amount of loss. If you're not sure because you're, that's still being calculated, you're still in the process of figuring that out, that takes time. Don't feel rushed or pressured. Comply with any policy requirements that you have, but don't be afraid to write, you know, undetermined, still being investigated as you conduct, again, your due diligence. So first steps, number one, make sure to report the claim to your insurance company. Most, if not all of you, have already done this by now, but just in case anybody hasn't, again, you wanna get in touch with them immediately. Here we go. Obtain a complete copy of your homeowner's insurance policy, all right? Many times, the adjuster will provide you solely with the declarations page. The declarations page is the page that says like structure, A, and then a number, you know, personal property, and then a number. So it's just the coverages and the number. You, what you want is a full and complete copy of your policy, including all declarations, endorsements, and riders, okay? If you were not able to get these out of your house before you evacuated, you request these for the insurance company and our suggestion is that you make that request in writing. Email is fine, all right? So make that request to them. When you get that complete copy, make a working copy for yourself. Literally just make a photocopy and then that working copy is one that you can write on as you go through and you, you know, you're figuring out what the various terms mean and you're making notes to yourself. Make a working copy that you can write all over. So you maintain a clean copy and a working copy that you work with.
Next, what you want to do is read that insurance policy. Now, let me just be honest with you guys. Prepare yourself. Insurance policies are written by lawyers. They are not easy to read or understand. Even judges have a hard time with them. Be, be gentle with yourself. Give yourself time. It will probably take you a couple of times to get through it. But it really is a crucial piece of your recovery. I mean, trying to navigate this without having read the policy and at least just trying to gain a basic understanding. It's almost like trying to play poker blindfolded. Do you know what I'm saying? Relying on somebody else to tell you what cards are in your hand. So again, read the policy. It takes time. It may take several times. That's OK. You use your little yellow book, the UP Claims Online Library to help you figure out terms. You talk to friends. You attend meetings like this to educate yourself. Contrario preferentum is a Latin term. that means any ambiguities are drafted against the person who drafted that document. So ambiguities are construed in your favor, all right? Start a claim diary. This is one of the most, if you take nothing else from this meeting tonight, I urge you to write this one down and just remember this, start a claim diary. It kind of begs the question, what is a claim diary, lady? All right, a claim diary is a written, basically a written record of any conversations, interactions that you have with insurance company personnel, adjusters, representatives, and the like. So you, what you want to be doing is say you meet with your adjuster, Maybe certain promises are made or representations are made about timing of things, etc. What you want to do is make sure you write down in your claim diary, and a claim diary can be something as simple as a spiral notebook. It doesn't have to be any formalized, you know, like official thing that says claim diary on it. Go get a spiral notebook from CVS, or better yet, ask a friend to get one for you and bring it to you. All right? So what you want to write, what you want to do is write down the date, who made the promise, and what the substance of that promise was. All right, important. Why do you need a claim diary? Well, it's very likely that the first adjuster assigned to your case will not be the last, all right? So again, you have an adjuster now, but it's again very typical to, again, for these adjusters to hand off at some time in the process, and sometimes even again and yet again. It's gonna vary. Some of you may and very unusually end up with a single adjuster, but it's far more common that again, we've got these catastrophic adjusters in here right now, and then they will hand off at some point. So it's incredibly important that you create a written, written record of what was agreed to. All right, so a claim diary helps you keep track of the claim and make sure that it pushes forward, all right, and moves forward. Also, and kind of in conjunction with this, is you wanna document the claims process in writing. Putting these in writing lets the insurance company know that you're keeping track, all right? Um, some adjusters may try to handle the claims by telephone almost exclusively. So it may be, a, I see a lot of people going like, yeah, yeah, that's happening, lady, all right. So again, documentation is everything if you encounter a claims handling issue down the line. So again, maybe some promises are made um, and you rely on that and then later a new adjuster comes in, they have a different take on what should be happening or a different take on that promise. You're like, well, so-and-so told me that and they're like, mm, I talked to him, uh, he doesn't recall that. Y again, create a paper trail and document it right. So again, documentation is everything when dealing with your insurance adjuster. So again, confirm promises made by the insurance company. You're writing them down in your claims diary and confirm them in writing emails count, all right? So again, you're just trying to create a paper trail of what's been agreed to and what's happening in the claim. If you have a specific policy coverage question, don't be afraid to put those questions in writing and ask for a written response. So if you're reading through something and you're like, I'm not sure what this means or how this applies or how this timeline works, put that question in writing and ask for a written response. And an important tip, any time that you send uh, a question to your insurance company or a uh, correspondence that asks for a response, be sure to put a deadline for a response, a reasonable timeline. You know, thank you very much for responding within seven days of the date of this email. Thank you very much for responding within 10 days of the date of this email. Some reasonable amount of time for them to get back to you. You want to get educated so that you can navigate this large loss claim. There is a steep learning curve in navigating a large loss insurance claim. And it's very different than maybe an auto or theft claim that you might have previously navigated previously in your lives. Um, coming to this meeting, again, is a really good first step, you guys. Great job. 
Get help making sense of your policy. Again, online at the UP website, a simplified guide to your homeowner's insurance policy, again, in the UP Claims Help Library. Um, the Claim Help Library has additional samples, tip sheets, templates. This is all free of charge. It's how I discovered United Policy Holders when my own home burned down. Um, just, it's a t the website's a treasure trove of free um, policyholder friendly information, so make use of it. The Little Yellow Disaster Recovery Handbook, which again is currently in reprint after we have handed out 700 copies at the LAC, but will be back in stock soon at the LAC. Insurance lingo, all right, so those were some general, general information. So let's can dig now into some uh, lingo. At first, it may sound like your adjuster is speaking an entirely different language. ACV, RCV, depreciation, scope of loss. Um, you know, what do all these terms mean? The good news is that most homeowners insurance policies follow a similar format and are divided into sections. Here we go. Coverage A is your dwelling coverage. Most policies today sold are extended replacement value policies, which increase your coverage A limits by a set percentage. Typical percentages, 25%, 50%, sometimes even 100%. When your coverage A limits are not enough, to repair or replace your lost or damaged premises. A few insurance companies will apply that extended replacement percentage to your other coverages. Most do not, but that's a good thing to check for. Is your coverage A adequate? Now we're talking about our structural. Rough, rough math. Divide the coverage A limit, exclude, including any extended replacement coverage percentage by the square footage of your home. All right, so we've got an example, divide that, and then you can figure out what you're insured for per square foot. Now obviously, rebuilding costs vary widely depending on the geography, et cetera. So again, but that will at least give you a very quick and very rough idea, oh, per square foot, what am I insured at? That's a useful piece of information, at least at a preliminary stage in trying to assess um, what kind of coverage you have. Candidly, a scope of loss on the destroyed or damaged property will provide you with the actual cost to rebuild or repair your home. So a scope of loss is much more detailed, but this is a preliminary kind of down and dirty quick calculation. Under insurance, most disaster survivors have inadequate coverage A limits. I was underinsured, so again, it's a very common problem. I'm gonna come back to this in a few minutes. Coverage B is your other structures. This generally covers structures on the premises but not attached to the dwelling. Examples would be retaining wall, gazebo, uh, fencing, things of that nature. Coverage C, personal property. All right, visualize your house. Now rip off the roof, pull it off of its foundation, shake it upside down, what falls out? That's your personal property. All right, so that's an easy way to kind of visualize what your personal property is. Coverage D, additional living expense, also known as loss of use. This covers expenses associated with the loss of your home, including, um, again, rental costs on a comparable uh, temporary housing, rental furniture, boarding your pets. Maybe now you have to commute further to work, and so that increased mileage um, necessitated by the new um, temporary location would be covered. These are just a few examples. All right, so again, those are the main categories as you divvy down on your declaration page. Now coming back to, to interacting with that insurance company. Two words describe the best demeanor that you could take when navigating this claim. Polite assertiveness. All right, polite assertiveness. In any communication, written or oral, you're the good guy, you know what I'm saying? You're cooperative. I'm not talking about being like a pushover or such. Polite assertiveness. I often tell people, kind of visualize if you, know, you write an email, if that was projected, say you ended up in court, which hopefully nobody will, nobody wants to, um, what would that look like projected to um, just uh, you know, a neutral set of people? Would it look like you're the cause of problems? Do you know what I'm saying? So again, and as this process goes on, it can be very, very um, tempting sometimes to vent to, uh, to your insurance company. Vent to a friend, 
all right? Vent to a friend or a neighbor. Have a group of you where you're like, it's uh, Vent Tuesday. Come on over, it's Venting Tuesday, and we're just gonna get together and vent. But do not vent in that deconstructive way with your insurance company. That does not help. So polite assertiveness. Again, business transaction, right? Business transaction. Other useful advice, stay connected to other fire survivors. This was one of the most useful things I did in my own fire, and I've seen this over and over again in my now, what, uh, 12 years uh, volunteering with United Policyholders. Stay connected to other fire survivors. They're great sources of information. Insurance recovery, rebuilding, social emotional, um, you know, financial strategies. What you're gonna find too is that kind of the emotional issues may change as this process goes on. Um, right now there's a lot of support, which is phenomenal and it's just amazing. But sometimes as this process drags out, you know, sometimes a tone can change. Um, maybe neighbors or others might be like, hey, it's been a year, why aren't you even, why, ha why aren't you rebuilt? So sometimes that tenor can change. So having other fire survivors who are like, oh my gosh, I'm just having a rough time too. And having that connectivity, it's really good for your peace of mind. All right, coming back to about under insurance. If you don't have enough coverage to replace or rebuild your home contents or other structures, um, then you are underinsured. So again, you can be underinsured in any of these categories. So it's when you don't have enough policy benefits to actually um, replace or um, replace uh, that, those items. Again, a very pervasive insurance problem after suffering a total loss. It is such a big problem that United Policyholders has an entire section of our website devoted to this issue. Under insurance stats, just to give you an idea, um, United Policyholders very commonly conducts claims um, status surveys um, to get a feel for how people are progressing. These are really important. And here are some stats on under insurance in recent wildfire um, loss uh, events, give you an idea of the scope of this problem. It may take you a while to determine if you are underinsured, you guys. Don't just take an insurance company's word as to whether you have adequate insurance or not, all right? Obtaining an independent scope of loss from a qualified professional will provide you with the actual cost to replace your destroyed home. Again, I'm gonna elaborate on this point again in a few minutes. But again, it takes time to quantify these losses. Why would my insurance company underinsure me? Well, don't they want to sell as much as possible to collect a bigger premium? Well, there's a real historical context here. Back in the 1991 uh, Berkeley, Oakland firestorm, most policies at that time written were called uh, guaranteed replacement value policies. Guaranteed replacement value policies held that, again, if that A number was not enough, say that A number was not large enough, the insurance company was still obliged to replace your destroyed home. All right? So again, what that meant was that there were a lot of over policy losses that they ended up paying out. So there was a gradual change to extended replacement policies. So extended replacement policies with this 25%, 50%, 100%, you know, extension percentage, is it a capped loss? Right? So from a business perspective, rather than having uncapped losses, such as in those um, guaranteed replacement, now in the extended replacement, there are capped losses. So from a business perspective, it makes a better sense for them. And also just preservation of market share. Some truths about underinsurance. Getting an insurer to pay more than the policy says that they owe is not easy, all right? Unfortunately, there is not a one-size-fits-all on this issue. Each insurance company has a different approach to handling underinsurance claims. You want to educate yourself about underinsurance. Go to our website and read up about it. Um, network with others insured by your same company. That can be a really strong uh, strategy in terms of coping and learning and educating yourself. The strengths and weaknesses of every underinsurance case are very factually specific. Again, you and your neighbor might both be underinsured. You might have a strong underinsurance case. They may have a weak one. All right? So again, maybe you have a written record of some representations that were made, whereas they don't. All right? For example. 
professional help, an experienced policyholder attorney can assess the strengths and weaknesses of an underinsurance claim. Some of the factors are on this slide, but it really does take um, an assessment if you think you might be in that boat. Um, again, very factually specific. Lowballing, another common problem after a loss. What is lowballing? You're like, hey, lady, you just told me about underinsurance. What's the difference between underinsurance and lowballing? Lowballing is when the insurance company provides you with a scope of loss or estimate for to repair or replace your damaged or destroyed premises that is lower than the actual cost to repair or replace. You could both be underinsured and lowballed. I was. So again, another common problem. So related but different. Lowballing stats, just to give you an idea of the pervasiveness of this problem. Again, previous claim status surveys gives you an idea in previous wildfire disasters, the rates at which people were reporting being lowballed by their insurance company. And again, full results available on the UP website. Why would my insurance company lowball me? Well, for the same reason that anyone makes uh, you know, uh, a low opening offer in a large business transaction, right? You know, you go in to buy a car, you don't start with your highest amount, right, that you're gonna pay, you start with the, you know, in lowest and you work your way up. How can you counteract lowballing? So if that happens, how can I counteract that? Get and present to your insurer detailed written estimates from reputable independent builders. You can also consider hiring your own expert to create an independent scope of loss for your destroyed home. Kind of as discussed above, coping with underinsurance, a similar strategy to cope here with lowballing. Consider setting up a face-to-face -face meeting between your selected contractor and your insurance adjuster to reconcile pricing and scope differences. Well, I've mentioned this term, independent scope of loss. Who prepares that? Usually, either a forensic estimator or a forensic architect or a contractor. That's who we would typically see. This, the goal, if you do end up deciding to uh, pay out the money to prepare an independent scope of loss, is to find someone who can create a scope of loss that can be compared alongside the insurance company's scope of loss so that you can compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges, right? Is it in a similar format so that the cost can be gone down and you can say their cost is this, we said it was this. So something that can go apples to apples. A Couple of quick tips on hiring a forensic estimator contractor to prepare a scope of loss. Some questions you would want to ask them if that ends up being an avenue that you want to pursue. Have they prepared a scope of loss for an insurance loss before? What are their professional qualifications? What licenses do they hold? And are those licenses in good standing? Ask for references and check them. This is a good example of something that maybe you could offload to somebody else. I mean, everybody, I'm sure your to-do list, if it looked like anything like mine did, um, every day was like a list, it felt like of 100 things. Wherever you can, hand off items to people who have offered to help. You know, maybe you need to check references on a builder or a forensic estimator. You know, ask a friend who's offered to be of assistance, hey, can you check those references for me and get back to me? I'd appreciate that help, because it's time consuming, but that's something you could easily hand off to somebody who's offered to help. Clarify the extent of their services. Does the cost of the preparation of the scope of loss include time that might be spent answering questions from the insurance company about that scope of loss? Are they prepared to defend that scope of loss during mediation and litigation? And if so, do they charge to do that? Have they ever had to defend a scope of loss in that context before? These are all good questions. Scams are very common after disasters, you guys. Before you hire a repair or pro professional or any professional of any type, be sure to check their customer references and their licensing, all right? No matter who you're considering hiring. 
try to avoid paying large upfront fees before any work has been done. My own fire, I remember there was somebody running around our neighborhood with a skip loader offering to clear debris for cash. I mean, I just, you know, there were strange, strange things going on. So just be thoughtful. And, and, and again, it'd be one thing if, uh, you know, each of you had planned for this, like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna build myself my dream house. And you planned for it. And, you know, we wouldn't even have to say stuff like this, but when you're exhausted, traumatized, uh, you know, stressed out, these kinds of things might fall by the wayside just because you aren't at full critical, you know, skill set um, due to the, uh, the exhaustion. So again, check licensing and references. Public adjusters as a help resource. A public adjuster is a private claims adjuster who works for you, not the insurance company. Public adjusters typically charge on a contingency basis. Five to 15% is typical. A red flag should immediately go up if you have a public adjuster who is trying to rush you into or rush you or pressure you into hiring them. Nobody should be rushing you or pressuring you. Your house just burned down. Do you know what I'm saying? So again, if somebody's really putting the hard sell, uh, you know, consider putting on the brakes and maybe make sure it's not somebody who's just trying to take advantage of the fact that you're not, you know, not necessarily at your best at this moment. So again, don't be rushed or pressured. Pros and cons of hiring a public adjuster. Pros, a diligent public adjuster can take the weight off your shoulders by documenting the claim and negotiating a higher settlement than you might be able to get on your own. That would be the pros, right? What's the cons? An overloaded or unethical public adjuster can further delay your claim and make matters worse or diminish your settlement. And since they take a percentage, um, obviously if they're not doing a good job for you, that would not be money well spent and money that you could uh, put into your rebuild, all right? I think it's just like anything else in any profession, you know, dentist, lawyer, engineer, there's good ones, there's not good ones, you know? You get in a cavity, you go to a good dentist, they fill the cavity, you're on your way. You go to the dentist, you don't get a good dentist, all of a sudden you're getting a root canal. What just happened? Do you know what I'm saying? So it's just, you know, you wanna do your homework. If you decide to hire a public adjuster, then here are some key tips. Be sure to hire only a licensed public adjuster. Ask for their license number and check it. Ask for references and check them. Also, ask them if they're a member of CAPIA and or NAPIA. CAPIA, California Association of Public Insurance Adjusters, NAPIA is the national um, uh, corollary. These are their professional trade organizations. So that's at least a data point that you can use, like, hey, uh, are they invested enough to be a member of their trade organizations? That's a data point that you can use. So this is a list of things to consider. For more information, I urge you to visit UP's website, www.uphealth.org. All right. And so to finish my portion of the presentation tonight, I made a little visual uh, journey of one family's journey home after the loss of our home in 2003. And I hope it gives you guys some hope and encourage, encouragement as you embark on this journey of your own. All right. So there we are. That's uh, October 28th, two days after our home went down. Uh, 321 homes in Scripps Ranch, but over 20, about 2,300 losses in that fire total that took down our house. That's my daughter's bike that we just found there in the debris. All right, so that was October. Now March 2004, and we've hired a builder. So there's our building sign. It's a happy day. August 2004. Foundation poured for the new house, all right? Um, I remember going out there, watching them pour that. It's a big machine that they put out there, taking the photos. And again, it was nice to see that construction going forward. October 2004, now framing's underway. We commonly refer to this as sticks in the air. Like, oh, do you have sticks in the air? And that was a good moment. Like, oh, we got sticks in the air. All right. Everybody would be super happy about that. So this is roughly, you guys, at least on our journey at the one-year mark, roughly. January 2005, starting to look like a house. More and more there. March 2005, now we see that siding coming on, looking more and more like a house. 
and July 17, 2005, we moved back in. For us, it was 21 months after the fire. When I first went to my own LAC, Local Assistance Center, after my house burned down, I remember a disaster recovery worker telling me um, I was probably looking at one to three years on average. And I just remember at that moment, my daughter had just started second grade, and I, I felt sick. I, th I literally thought I was going to throw up when they said that, because I couldn't wrap my head around that. I was like, wait, are you saying she's going to be in fourth grade? I, what are you even talking about? It's a process, you guys. One to three years is typical. Some people may get in earlier. Some people may take longer. So again, there's a continuum, all right? And there's my husband and I after uh, returning to our rebuilt home. We got our landscape in, and we made it back. So, yay. Finally, I'm going to leave you with this thought. When I get, moved back into my new house, uh, my son's playgroup, he was two when our house burned down, and we had a playgroup of friends and uh, moms with kids some more age, and they got us a bench for our backyard, and it had this saying on it. And they said that it made them think of what we had been through and what they had seen. So I was still get a little choked up looking at it because it was so thoughtful, but it really does, to me, capture this experience looking back. What lies before you, what lies behind you is nothing compared to what lies within you. Again, you guys, I'm so very sorry for your loss, and I hope this presentation has been helpful. Oh, thank you.